All right, so now we're starting period three, which covers roughly the time period 600 CE to 1450 CE. And within this, we're gonna talk about like the expansion and intensification of communication and exchange networks. So even though Afro-Eurasia and the Americas were separated from one another, you see a deepening and widening of the networks of human interaction within and across regions. And the results were unprecedented concentrations of wealth and the intensification of cross-cultural exchanges. Um, innovations in transportation, state policies, mercantile practices, all contributed to the expansion and development of commercial networks, which then in turn served as conduits for cultural, technological, and biological diffusion. So basically what this is saying is new inventions and innovations innovations as well as positive state policies help to expand these networks and then you also have diffusion of culture, technology, and biology all through these networks. And the pastoral or nomadic groups played a key role in creating and sustaining these networks, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the expanding networks fostered greater interregional borrowing while at the same time sustained regional diversity. And the Prophet Muhammad promoted Islam, which was a new monotheistic religion at this point, at the beginning of the period, and it strongly influenced the rest of the period uh, because it spread quickly through trade, warfare, and diffusion. You have improved transportation technologies and commercial practices, which led to an increased volume of trade. And then you're also expanding the range of this trade. So you've got existing trade networks that are expanding, and then new trade networks that are being created too. So the trade routes that we know about during this period are the Silk Roads, the Mediterranean Sea, the Trans-Saharan, the Indian Ocean Basin, all of those already existed, but they continued to flourish and promote the growth of powerful new trading cities. Um, and examples of these trade cities would be like Novgorod, Timbuktu, the Swahili city-states, Hangzhou, Cal uh, Calicut, Baghdad, Malacca, Venice, Tanakhchitlan, uh, and Cahokia, which you'll see on the next map. So as you see on the map here, you've got all of the major cities that I just talked about on this map, and they became major trading locations. So you can see in Europe, you've got Venice, and Venice is going to be a big hot point this period. Timbuktu, also a really big hot point this period. Baghdad, too. Um, Calicut. Hangzhou, uh, Malacca, all of these are highly connected to various trade routes. So the old trade routes you can see up there, you've got new ones as the Andes and Mesoamerican, but absolutely highly important during this period. Also on this map, you can see, again, the major cities are highlighted with little stars, but then you also see the empires at this point in time. Um, and all of these are going to be empires that we talk about during this time period. In the Americas, you've got communication and exchange networks developing, like the Mississippi River Valley, Mesoamerica, the Andes, all of those places you're going to see a growth of those civilizations and their networks. You have luxury goods being traded, uh, and all, all parties involved were very happy about the luxury goods being traded. You got silk, coming from China. Uh, you've got cotton textiles coming from Egypt and India. You've got porcelain. Um, you have spices, which were absolutely important to preserve meat and make stuff taste better. Uh, precious metals and gems being traded. So the elite obviously wanting more things to make them look more elite. Uh, slaves absolutely were being traded during this time period. And exotic animals as well. Um, You'll, you'll see that with various voyages and travels that people will bring back the exotic animals to that area and they'll be like, oh, this is really cool. I want more. So innovations, you've got the growth of interregional trade and that was encouraged by significant innovations in the previously existing transportation and commercial technologies, which included the caravan sarai, which was roadside inns where the caravanners would rest and recover from the day's journey. You've also got camel saddles, making things a little more comfortable and larger ship designs in sea travel. You also have the use of the compass and astrolab to help direct you where to go in those new bigger ships.
you've got new forms of credit and monetization. Um, so you've got like bills of exchange, which make things like official. You've got credit being offered. Uh, you have checks being offered also. So it comes from like your bank account. You have these banking houses being created. So that's basically your early banking systems. And it makes things a lot easier and simpler to work with. You also have governments now creating like official forms of currency for their civilization, basically. Um, commercial growth was also facilitated by the state practices, as I just said. They'll start minting coins specifically for their area. And also the use of paper money we start to see as the Chinese share their paper making technology skills. You got a huge impact of trading organizations at this point in time. So what you see pictured are is the Hanseatic League, basically. And it was formed for mutual financial benefit of the members, specifically the Hamburg salt mines, which you see in the little salt shaker, and the Lubeck herring fishermen, which you see with the little fish. Uh, it became a model for other alliances, not only at that point in time, but also in the future. It was an assembly created to enforce rules, basically trading rules, to make sure that everything was being done fairly. And they created a monopoly of trade goods in Northern Europe. And their influence is still seen today with like Lufthansa, with Air Hansa. It is the largest airline in Europe. Uh, the soccer team, FC Hansa, you've got Hansa Bank, Hansa University. Um, and that is all directly influenced by the Hanseatic League from this point in time. But you can see how they're highly connected to the major sea trade routes. You have state-sponsored commercial infrastructures like the Grand Canal in China, which helped to connect the major commercial and government cities with the agricultural area of China, um, since they were not right next to each other. And it also helped to connect the major rivers. You have the expansion of empires, um, which facilitated trans-Eurasian trade and communication because new peoples were then drawn into their conquerors' economies and trade networks. So the first one we're going to talk about is Imperial China, which you can see there on the map. Um, you can see the Sui Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty, and the Song Dynasty. Um, and those stretched from 589 to about 1279. And 1279 is when the Mongols invaded. So you can see the different, the different borders of the different regions. Um, you also can see the Grand Canal that was built. And you can see the Great Wall, how those infrastructure projects were influential to the different borders. Okay, so Imperial China, you have the Sui Dynasty, which ruled from 581 to 618. They unified China, they built the Grand Canal. Um, the Grand Canal, as I said before, was built to provide a means of transporting rice and other crops from the Yangtze River Valley to the populous north. The Tang Dynasty followed the Sui Dynasty, and it was a period of relative prosperity and stability. You've got an expansion of Chinese territory. Um, you can see the bureaucracy changing and expanding. Neo-Confucianism is founded, and that's a syncretic faith or philosophy that combines rational thought with the metaphysics of Taoism and Buddhism. Following the Tang Dynasty, you've got the Song Dynasty, which was a smaller region than the Tang, but it was more prosper. Well, it was also prosperous with arts flourishing and increased urbanization, so people are moving to the cities. Um, also, you've got the Jin Dynasty, um, which were created by the Jurchen people, and they were a nomadic group that created a dynasty in the northern part of China, forcing the Song south, and that's when you have the creation of the Southern Song Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty was when the Mongols took over China and then controlled China for a little less than 100 years. And then the Ming Dynasty, those were the people who overthrew the Mongols in about 1368, and they ruled until about 1644. The Byzantine Empire. So remember, the Byzantine Empire was formed when the Roman Empire split. So the Roman Empire had spread out. You've got your Western Empire and your Eastern Empire. You can see the extent of the Byzantine Empire in 527 in orange. And what was added by 565 was all the yellow. So you can see it was a very extensive empire. 
So in the Byzantine Empire, you've got the capital of Constantinople, and it was also considered the cultural center. You can see the Hagia Sophia pictured behind, which is in Constantinople, um, today known as Istanbul. And Justinian, he ruled from 527 to 565, and he oversaw the revitalization of Constantinople. He built it up. He built the Hagia Sophia, and he codified Roman laws, and he expanded Byzantine territory. The Hagia Sophia was originally built as a Christian church, then it became Eastern Orthodox when the schism happened, and then eventually it was made into an Islamic mosque when Constantinople was taken over by the Muslims. And now today it is a museum. Uh, Justinian's code was the foundation of legal knowledge in Europe until the 19th century. So he codified all of the Roman laws and put all of them together. So he made them a standard set of laws. Uh, Cyril and Methodius, they were missionaries who created the Cyrillic alphabet, which was later adopted by both the Russians and the Slavic nations. So highly, highly influential. And the Eastern Orthodox Church, there was controversy over papal decisions, and it led to a schism or a split in the Catholic Church where you now have the Roman Catholic Church in Western Europe, obviously based in Rome, and the Eastern Orthodox Church in Southeastern Europe and Russia, and this all occurred in about 1054. The Islamic Caliphates. So you can see the spread of the Islamic empires through that map. So you can see why it's very simple and quick for Islam to spread after its foundation. Um, and as the armies continued to conquer just to create larger empires, uh, the religion spread throughout the empire and continued to spread through trade. But you can see the, see the extent of the Islamic empires. So the Bedouins, they were a nomadic tribal and polytheistic groups in the Arabian Peninsula prior to Islam being founded. Then you have Muhammad, who was technically a Bedouin, and he was the founder of Islam. He believed in social justice, including alms for the poor, and he spread Islam throughout the Arabian Peninsula, which was pretty impressive. Um, so it was founded in Mecca, and Medina is also highly important to the Islamic faith. And within Mecca, you've got the Kaaba, which is the shrine of Islam. And one of the five pillars of Islam is to make at least one pilgrimage in your life, if you're able, to the Kaaba, um, which is what's pictured on the bottom right. Um, Uma and Dimi. So Uma is community or the nation with common ancestry and geography. So Uma is the Islamic people. And Dimi are non-Muslim citizens of an Islamic nation. So you'll see those terms a lot during this period, especially as you have the Muslim conquests throughout the Afro-Eurasia locations. Um, the Quran uh, basically means recitation, and that is the holy book of Islam. The Hadith, uh, those are sayings of Muhammad or reports about something he did. There are a lot of those, and they're looked to for guidance other than the Quran. Um, then you've got Rashidun, Umayyad, and the Abbasid Caliphates. So the Rashidun Caliphs, that uh, they, they're they Sunni Muslim. Um, so you've got your split of Sunni and Shiite. And this refers to the 30-year reign of the first four Caliphs after Muhammad. And they're referred to as the rightly guided Caliphs. Um, then you've got your Umayyad, who ruled from 661 to about 750, and they were the generals who had assumed power over Ali, who was the fourth caliph, and controlled the largest territory of anyone since the Roman Empire, and their capital was based in Damascus. Then following them, you've got the Abbasids, 750 to 1258. Their capital was at Baghdad, and they were very powerful and wealthy. Uh, they faced four groups of attacks, the Mamluks, the Seljuk Turks, and the Crusaders, and the Mongols, and the Mongols eventually overtook them. Um, within Islam, you've got the harem and the veil, so they're basically limits on women within Islamic society. The harem was a dwelling which was set aside for wives and concubines and children of these women, and the veils were there to cover the women. 
Uh, the Crusades, I mentioned them before, but under the Abbasids, the Christians could travel easily to and from their holy sites in and around Jerusalem, uh, which the Dome of the Rock you can see up there uh, on the top. And when the Seljuk Turks limited the access to Jerusalem, the Christians in Europe organized the Crusades to reopen access. And in 1091, Pope Urban II called for reclaiming the Holy Land. And from roughly 1095 to 1200, you have the Crusades. The Mongol Empire. So you can see that picture, the overall extent uh, on the map there. And eventually it was broken up into the different Khanates, but you can see the overwhelming extent. I mean, it, it stretched all the way from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. That, that's impressive. That's incredible to think about. So Temujin was the Mongol leader that created neighboring alliances. He got all of the warring Mongol groups, because remember they were a nomadic group, um, he got all of them to stop their fighting and come together as one. So he was elected Khan of the Mongolian Kingdom and he took on the title Genghis Khan, or ruler of all. Uh, he was incredibly ruthless in battle. Uh, he It was very common for the fear to spread ahead of places they were going to attack because he had no problem killing an entire village if they refused to surrender. Um, and he was a really skilled strategist. Often he would uh, send in a small group of fighters and they would go into an area and they would be attacked, obviously. They would start to retreat. And as they retreated, the villagers would come out following in their attack and then ultimately would be surrounded by the rest of the Mongol army. And like it, it was incredibly brilliant strategy. Uh, under Genghis Khan, you have Pax Mongolica, which was an era of great prosperity um, in the Mongolian Empire. And Genghis Khan actually was a really fair and tolerant ruler. Like, he was ruthless in battle, but he was really easy to live under. And as you can see from, like, all the different Khanates on the map before, it was incredibly tolerant in the fact that the people that lived there were still able to believe their beliefs and practice their beliefs. And quite often the Mongols in that area decided to take on those beliefs as well. Now that'll start to cause some of the fractures later, but for now, it was a really good time in Mongolia. Uh, yurts are circular felt-covered tents, which is how the Mongols traveled and lived. Uh, the Mongols came from the steppe, um, the Eurasian steppe, which were grasslands without trees apart from those like near rivers and lakes, so generally great grasslands, which makes sense because they were nomadic. They were pastoralists. They were going where their herds fed. Um, not only were they really, really good at strategy and ruthless in battle, they had created the Mongol bow, which was used to shoot at targets while the Mongols were moving on horseback. It was incredibly advanced weaponry for the time. Not only that, but they were super skilled. I mean, think about it. You're moving on a horse and you're able to hit targets accurately with a bow and arrow. It's pretty incredible. Um, the Kurultai was the meeting of the political and military councils of the Khans. So Khans are like the different kingdoms or the regions of the kingdoms. So that's why you've got ruler of all, Genghis Khan, and you've got Khanates, the, the all part. So those are, that's, that is the country, if you want to call it that. Um, yams were postal messenger systems in the Mongol Empire, so that's how you got information from Khan to Khan. And Kublai Khan was the grandson of Genghis Khan, and he became the Great Khan in 1260. He created the Yuan Dynasty in China, and he ruled the Mongol Empire from the seat in China. And he actually, it was, he was so influential that Marco Polo visited him in the 1270s and ended up working for him for 17 years within the Yuan Dynasty. Um, unfortunately, though, about the time of Kublai Khan's death was when you start to see the dismantling of the Mongol Empire, largely because it was so overexpanded and th there was very little unity amongst the Mongol Empire. Early African civilizations. So there's a lot going on in Africa at this point in time also. Um, 
different groups that you've got. You've got your West African groups, the Ghana, Mali, Songhai. Um, you've got the Axum over on the eastern, northeastern portion. You got your Swahili city states down on the Indian Ocean. Um, and you've got Bantu migrations in the middle. Oh, yeah, and Great Zimbabwe down on the Indian Ocean Basin, too. So early African civilizations, your Bantu migrations. So that's when the Bantu language group spread from its beginning in modern day Nigeria and Cameroon to the east and to the south. And eventually it covered about a third of the continent in Africa. And the spread of this language group was a result of migration of Bantu speaking peoples and their cultural diffusion. And not only did they speak the new language, but, or they spread the language, but they also spread agriculture and iron metallurgy, so iron metalworking. But not only did that they bring that, they brought malaria with them too. So that was a nice little present that they brought. Um, they had matrilineal tribes. So ancestry came through the mother and was tracked through the mother. They believed in a single God creating the world with many spirits inhabiting the world. Um, they practiced ancestor veneration because they believed that after death, the spirits remained on earth to help guide the living. And you also see the ancestor veneration in China, remember? Uh, the griots were storytellers. They were the conduits of history for a community, and they possessed basically an encyclopedic knowledge of family lineages and the lives and deeds of the great leaders. So they were your historians. They were not only were they your historians, they were your or oral storytellers. Um, they were very adept at music and would often sing the stories and then accompany themselves with instruments. They were venerated and they were feared because of the power of language and story, but they were the ones you turned to for information. Your um, Coptic Christians, so that was a new type of Christianity. It was developed independently from Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, and the people combined it with their traditional faiths, and, like ancestor veneration and beliefs and spirits and stuff. So. It created a distinct form of faith known as Coptic Christianity, and Ethiopia was a, an early adopter of Coptic Christianity. Um, Swahili was a syncretic language, so it was created from the Bantu migration. So it's Bantu melded with an Arabic vocabulary, so you see the influence of the Islamic traders uh, in Ghana. Mali and Songhai, you've got uh, West African kingdoms there that were incredibly prosperous. They sold gold and ivory in exchange for salt and copper, cloth and tools. Timbuktu was one of their major trading cities in Mali. Uh, Sundayata was Mali's founding ruler and he became the subject of legend. So his father had ruled over a small society in West Africa in what is today Guinea. And when his father died, rival groups invaded, killing most of the royal family and capturing the throne. They didn't bother to kill Sundayata because the young prince was crippled and he was not considered a threat. But in spite of his injury, he learned to fight and became so feared as a warrior that his enemies forced him into exile. But his time in exile only strengthened him and his allies. And in 1235, Sundayata, or the Lion Prince, returned to the kingdom of his birth, defeated his enemies, and then reclaimed the throne for himself. He was beloved within his kingdom, and he was an astute and capable ruler. And it is believed that he was Muslim and used that to create trade relationships with North Africa and the Arab merchants. Um, he was able to create a thriving gold trade within Mali. Then you've got Mansa Musa, who was Sundayata's grandnephew, and he was a really devout Muslim who made a pilgrimage to Mecca starting in 1324. And he took an extravagant caravan with him, and he displayed Mali's wealth to the outside world. When he got back to Mali, he, took, uh, he established religious schools in Timbuktu. He built mosques in Muslim trading cities, and he sponsored those who wanted to continue their religious studies elsewhere. And he supported, and, or he deepened the support for Islam within Mali, which was really, really good. Now, Great Zimbabwe, you'll see it pictured on the bottom right. That was the most powerful of all East African kingdoms between the 12th and the 15th centuries. It was situated between the Zambezi and Limpopo rivers, and their prosperity was built on agriculture, grazing, trade, and gold. They built a great stone wall around the capital city, known as Great Zimbabwe, and it was the first large stone wall in Africa without mortar. And you can still see it pictured like and standing today. 
uh, all of the royal city's buildings were made of stone, which was remarkable for the time period. Medieval Japan. So as for religion, you've got Shintoism, which was their traditional religion. You have Zen Buddhism, which was a combination of Taoist traditions and Buddhist doctrines, and it emphasized direct experience and meditation, but it also respected the beauty of nature. Um, within medieval Japan, you have the Taika reforms in 646, which the reforms were for increasing efficiency and getting control of society back from the aristocracy. Um, the laws put farmland under government ownership, so all taxes would then go to the government, not to the nobility. Then you have the Fujiwara clan. So they were the one who took control of the government in 710, and they moved the capital to Nara, where they modeled it after the Chinese government with its bureaucracy. And you've got the Heian period, lasting from about 794 to about 1185, where the capital got moved back to Heian, and the emperor was merely a figurehead, and it was like a merit-based bureaucracy, and it was an era of prosperity, really, um, within Japan. The Minamoto clan, they installed a shogun, or a military ruler, to reign supreme and separate from the emperor, who lost e whatever little power that they had. Um, the noble families then ruled over estates. Uh, they were called the daimyo, and they recruited samurai, which were the professional warriors, to live um, and work and protect, basically. So think of it like feudalism in Europe, but with different titles. And like the European, like the European knights lived a code of chivalry, you've got the code of Bushido for the samurai warriors. Um, the arts flourished during this time period, obviously. Um, so you've got the Tale of Genji, which was written by Lady Murasaki Shikubu. So yes, she absolutely was a woman, obviously. And she was also elite in the fact that she was part of the Japanese imperial court. Um, but she wrote this about Japanese court life and love, and it's got these everlasting themes, and it was also considered the first novel because it follows a narrative. And haikus are poems that really gained popularity during this period as well. As for medieval Europe, you see the rise of nation states at this point in time, and also city states too. So you can see the Vikings were influential, Carolingian Empire is influential, Al-Andalus is influential, you got your Italian city-states, London's over there, Constantinople's still important, Novgorod up in Russia is still pretty important, the Hanseatic League's hanging out up in the northern part of Europe. So you can see what all was going on in Europe at this point in time. So Charlemagne, he ruled the Frankish kingdom from about 768 to 814. Charlemagne was named the emperor of the Romans by the Pope in 800 for his conquest of Lombardy in Italy. And Charlemagne was a pretty decent ruler. He encouraged church-based education and he used regional administrators to help govern his empire. Um, similar bureaucracy. You've got feudalism, which was the system of obligations widespread in Europe from the 800s to the 1200s. The kings would pay the nobles with land, known as fiefs, and the landowners were called lords. The lords were the king's vassals, which means that they owe him their service, and the lords could have their own vassals if they had enough land to spare. And knights could be hired by the lords to fight for them by offering them pieces of land. And then the knights would be the vassals of the lords and owe the lord's service. And chivalry was a way to resolve disputes and show etiquette. Um, and women were to be protected but not have many rights. And then your serfs are your peasants. And they're at the very bottom of your, your food chain, in essence. Um, they were the ones who worked the land for the lords because the lords aren't going to get their hands dirty. They're the rich ones. Monasticism. So that was when clergy, so your monks, your priests, they lived on monasteries and then they meditated and prayed there, but because it was often on really nice land and because they were religious and this was the Holy Roman Empire and everything, they often wielded a lot of wealth and political influence. So some people grew to dislike the monasteries. 
Um, oh, manorial system, I didn't get to talk about that. Those are when you have large fiefs or estates, so super big, like, pieces of land, um, also known as manors, so manorial system. It provided both economic self-sufficiency and defense, so it is feudalism on a larger scale. So the serfs were peasants living on the manor grounds where you had small villages that often included a church, a blacksmith shop, a mill, and presses for making things like cider, wine, and oil. And then the serfs were tied to the land and couldn't travel or marry without the permission from their lords. And in exchange for protection provided by the lord, they paid tribute in the form of their crops or labor. So it, it was a really, really cheap labor system. Um, Okay, types of architectural design. You've got Romanesque versus Gothic. Romanesque cathedrals were rectangular in shape with stone vaulted ceilings that rested upon massive pillars and walls and windows were very few and narrow. So they were very dark and forbidding in appearance. Now, Gothic cathedrals, they were lighter and airier. They had architectural details like arches and spires and stained glass windows and gargoyles and flying buttresses. Um, flying buttresses are supports that extended outward from the wall to a stone foundation rather than running like alongside the wall. Um, so you've got all these things that make the church look lighter and airier. Um, so those were all things to help like draw people into the church. Scholasticism, this was a system of study which tried to reconcile like Aristotle knowledge with Christian faith. So trying to combine that science and logic with the Christian faith. And this was started by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. And it really opened the door for secularism, so worldly things, and Christian humanism of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And it also opened the door for learning in universities, which was a really big deal. The Vikings. So they were a big force to deal with in medieval Europe. They were Scandinavian and they were from present day Norway, Denmark, Sweden. Uh, they tended to travel in long light ships that could be carried if they needed to. They landed in England, Ireland, France, Belgium. They went into Russia along the rivers and they're really big with trading with Kiev Rus too. So they were they were widespread and influential. The Hanseatic League, as I talked about before, um, so those are the 13th century cities in northern Germany and Scandinavia forming this Hanseatic League, which was that commercial alliance that controlled trade in the North and Baltic Seas. But they work really cool because they drove out the pirates and they monopolized trade and goods such as timber, grain, leather, salted fish. They traveled to the Mediterranean and then they would pick up valuable goods from the Arab caravans over there and bring them back to northern Europe. It also was a way for things like the Black Death to spread. So the Black Death was introduced via trade routes, and this was the bubonic plague. It started in Europe, in Venice, and then it spread out along the trade routes, also thanks to the Hanseatic League, up into Northern Europe. It was a major epidemic from 1347 to 1351, but you've got additional breakouts in decades following. As many as 25 million people in Europe may have died from the plague. So economic activity, pretty well declined in Europe due to the reduced populations. It had lasting effects on feudalism too. It was kind of a downfall to feudalism because you had less people to do the work. Um, it caused the Catholic Church to lose a lot of their influence in Europe as well because it couldn't prevent the deaths and then it also helped to open the door for the Reformation, which we'll see in the next period. So effects of movement. You see the movement of peoples causing environmental and linguistic effects. Um, the impact of the people's movements, you see the Vikings in the North Atlantic. They used their long ships to travel into the ocean and into riverways, but it was usually to the detriment of the people they met. The Vikings aren't known for being warm and cuddly friends. Um, they, they tended to be pretty ruthless, like, leaders. Um, the Arabs or the Berbers, uh, they were in Sahara, and the Arabs and the Berbers in North Africa used the camel caravans to navigate the Trans-Saharan trade routes. And the nomads in Central Asia, uh, they used horses to travel the steppe, like the Mongols and the Huns. And you've got the expansion and intensification of long distance trade routes, often dependent on environmental knowledge and technical adaptations to it. 
So some migrations had significant environmental impacts. The migration of the Bantu-speaking peoples who facilitated the transmission of iron technologies and agricultural technologies in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you also have the maritime migrations of the Polynesian peoples who cultivated transplanted foods and domesticated animals as they moved to new islands throughout the Pacific, which is actually really cool to think about. As for the diffusion of languages, some migrations and commercial contacts led to this diffusion of languages, like the spread of Bantu languages, like Swahili. Um, you have the spread of Turkic and Arabic languages throughout Central Asia and Anatolia, like what we know as today as the Stans. And then Arabic also spread through basically Arab conquests, Arab Muslim conquests during the 7th century and spread into North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. You got cross-cultural exchanges being fostered by the intensification of existing or the creation of new networks of trade and communication, like so spread of Islam. You've got diasporic communities where different groups of people would live in various places. Think about like the Jewish diasporic communities. Um, you also have well, Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists also doing this. You have travelers writing about their travels. Think Marco Polo, Ibn Battuta. Um, you have cultural diffusion as well. So not only were people bringing their cultures with them, they were also bringing pieces of culture back with them when they went back to their homelands. So as Islam was based on the revelations of the prophet Muhammad and developed in the Arabian Peninsula, those beliefs and practices of Islam reflected the interactions among the Jews, the Christians, and Zoroastrians with the local Arabian peoples. And Muslim rule then expanded to many parts of Afro-Eurasia due to military expansion, and then Islam subsequently expanded through those activities of merchants and missionaries. So you see the creation of diasporic communities. In key places along very important trade routes, you've got merchants setting up diasporic communities. For example, the Muslim merchants um, in the Indian Ocean region, which you see in the green. You have Chinese merchant communities in Southeast Asia in the yellow. You have Soganet, Sog Dian, uh, which is basically Central Asian traders that lived in the heart of the Silk Road area. Uh, they had their merchant communities throughout Central Asia, which you see in the red. And then Jewish communities in the Mediterranean, Indian Ocean Basin, or along the Silk Roads, which you see in the blue. And in these diaspora communities, they introduced their own cultural traditions into the indigenous culture. So you have syncretic things being created too. So major travelers, you've got Ibn Battuta, who wrote his book Journey, um, and he was Moroccan or Berber, and he was Muslim, and he traveled about 73,000 miles or to 44 different countries, which you can see on the map there. Marco Polo wrote the travels of Marco Polo, and he was Italian and Christian, and he traveled about 25,000 miles when he traveled to China. And then Zhuang Zhang, wrote Journey to the West from Tang, China, and he was Buddhist, he traveled thousands of miles over into India and further north up into Central Asia as well. Cultural diffusion spread, so you've got increased cross-cultural interactions resulting in the diffusion of literacy, uh, artistic, and cultural traditions. Um, and they also resulted in the diffusion of scientific and technological traditions. So you've got Neo-Confucianism and Buddhism spreading in Southeast Asia. You have Hinduism and Buddhism spreading in Southeast Asia. You have Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia and Toltec Mexica and Indian Incan traditions in Mesoamerica and Andean America spreading. And then as for scientific and technological traditions, you've got Greek and Indian mathematics on Muslim scholars. Um, you have the return of Greek science and philosophy to Western Europe, thanks to Muslim and Al-Andalus in Iberia. And you have the spread of printing and gunpowder technologies from East Asia into the Islamic empires and Western Europe. There's also continued diffusion of crops and pathogens through the Eastern Hemisphere along the trade routes. So new foods and agricultural technologies like bananas in Africa, new rice varieties in East Asia, like remember the champa rice 
fast growing rice. Um, spread of cotton, sugar, citrus throughout Dar al Islam and the Mediterranean basin. So all of these would be new and exotic things coming to these new locations. But unfortunately, with the diffusion of crops, you've also got the spread of epidemic diseases like the Black Death or the bubonic plague.